the doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Dobek, and she's a dietitian. Hey, I'm Hannah Schuyler, and together we are the Doctor Doctor Dietitian Dietitian Collab. Collab. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you. Today is a hot topic, protein, protein, and more protein. What is the deal with protein, Hannah, our fearless dietitian? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's the thing I talk about most. Um, If I had to count how many times I say protein in a day, like, uh, it's insane. It's a lot. But it's so important. It's so important. And when we look at the general population, when we look at bariatric patients, like everybody, it's very important for. Um, So what is protein? There's a couple different ways we can kind of talk about what protein is. But um, from a nutrition sense, it is one of our three macronutrients. So our macronutrients are going to be the nutrients in food that provide us calories. That's basically what the macronutrients are. And they're found in the largest quantities in our foods. Hence, macro. Macro means big. We also have micronutrients. And don't worry, we will get into all of those later down the line. But um, so our three macronutrients are protein, fat, and carbohydrates. That's going to be, if you ever hear somebody talking about their macros, they're talking about the ratio of those three to each other and in their overall diet. The other thing that provides calories while we're on that is alcohol, but it is not considered a macronutrient Mm. because it's not necessary in the diet, but it does provide calories. Um, So protein is one of those three macronutrients. So it provides us calories. Each gram of protein gives us four calories. And in our body, it acts in a lot of different ways, Um, but we generally kind of think about it as being the building block of muscle. And protein is made up of things, we're going to get a little nerdy here, it's made up of things called amino acids. There's 20 amino acids, uh, nine are considered essential, and we have to get those from our food sources. So it's really important we get these amino acids because they help us to build up our muscles, but protein also acts in different ways. It acts in our hormones, it acts in different um, metabolic pathways, all of that. And that's essentially the basics of what protein is. No, that's that's a great start because we do hear macros. And sometimes people are like, what, is that, what does that mean? Like, yeah. oh, this is going to screw up my macros. It's just going to put too many carbs into the mix. And it is a little bit confusing. So let's, of course, we're focusing this one on protein. So tell me, like, why... Tell me more about why is protein so essential, especially in a post-op bariatric surgery patient diet? Yeah. So protein, when we when we look at our body, right, our body is composed of muscle, it's composed of fat, it's composed of bones, lots of water, all of that kind of stuff. But where we can get energy from is going to be our muscles and our fat, right? So when somebody is losing weight, we want them to lose fat mass, I don't want you to lose muscle mass. I want your muscles to be protected. But we need those amino acids. That's what your muscles are made out of. So when we don't give our body protein externally, we don't put it in through our food, our body is going to go and say, like, I need these amino acids to function. I'm going to take it from your muscles because they're stored. It's stored there. When we give adequate protein and you get it from your food, Then your body's like, okay, great, I'm meeting that need. I'm getting all the amino acids I need to function. I still need energy because after bariatric surgery, yes, you're going to be in a calorie deficit. Mm. So you're going to be in an energy deficit. So your body turns to its stored energy. So at that point, it can say, great, I'm going to turn to these fat stores. Mm. And so I'm going to use that for the energy to make up what I'm not getting from my food. And so that is why it's so important to meet your protein needs. Now, something that I think is a common misconception is that your protein needs go way high after surgery. They really don't. They may go up a little bit, especially acutely after surgery when we're healing. Protein needs always go up after any trauma, any sickness, any surgery. You're going to need a little more protein in that in that healing period of time. But when we look at long term, it's not that much more than what an, a normal average person would need. It's that the proportion of that protein on your plate in your diet is going to be probably more than it is prior to surgery. The proportion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to break that down, what would you say like roughly, because it's hard to get into precise percentages, but what would you say roughly when you glance at a plate, it should look like? Yeah. So before surgery, you know, if we're looking or, you know, general healthful diet, we're looking at about a quarter of your plate should be your protein source. 25%, maybe up to a third, just depending on your day. And again, it's going to vary meal to meal and day to day. 
after surgery, it's more about 50% of your plate is going to be that protein source. Um, and early post-op, it may be 75 to 100% of the plate is going to be protein. It can be really difficult to get anything else in in that, in that very immediate stage after surgery. Mm. So protein, there's early stages when you're on the diet progression and you're on more liquids and then it's more like mushy, smooth, pureed foods, and then you progress into soft foods. And every program out there, by the way, has their own diet progression, their own kind of outline of what they want you to follow. So please, of course, follow always your own program. But let's talk in the beginning stages. Let's go from there. So Everyone knows protein shakes. Mm -hmm. So there's some common ones. Tell us about what you think is great, what's not great, what should you look for, and what happens when you're like, I can't look at another shake. I oh cannot do this. No that, more. Yeah, I get that a lot. Um, so with, when you're looking for a protein shake, we're always going to try to aim for high quality. Of course, we want to choose high quality products and every you know everything that we do. The best quality of protein is going to be what's called an isolate. And again, this is going to get down the rabbit hole of science a little bit. But what they do is essentially they take, usually if it's a, an animal-based protein, it's going to come from whey, which comes from milk. So, you know, you think you're eating your curds and whey. So they separate mm. out the whey and then they filter it way, 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 way down until it is just that whey molecule isolated by itself. It's not attached to any of the sugars that are found in that milk. So like lactose, for instance, is commonly, you know, found in, in some of the products. So when you isolate it down, you get just that that plain way isolate. And our bodies are very good at absorbing and using that. And so that's often seen as kind of the gold standard of protein. There's also things if you're, you know, plant-based, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but there's like pea protein isolate. So they've done kind of the same thing with like green peas where they've isolated that protein out. So it's not mm. attached to the carbs, the starches, anything like that. There's also things called protein concentrates. And that's kind of like the step below the isolate. So when you think about they're doing this big filtering process, I think they like spray it dry, like it's this whole big production thing. Um, they don't go quite as far. So you get this whey protein concentrate, and that may have some low levels of the sugars attached to it. So it may have some of the lactose or galactose or any of the other things that are found in the, in the foods. And um, our bodies aren't quite as good at absorbing it. It's just not as pure, essentially. So I'm generally okay if somebody is, especially like you said, if somebody is tired of all the protein shakes and the one that they tolerate is a whey protein concentrate, I'm not going to say no. You know, get get in what you can. We know yeah. you're maybe you're not going to absorb all of it, um, but they usually have a higher amount anyway. So it kind of balances out, comes out in the wash. Um so those are kind of the two – those are really two of the main. The other ones we see are like filtered milk products, which is very similar, but they may not dry them and spray them and then reconstitute them. They just kind of filter milk down to get rid of all of that excess, just like they would do to get rid of lactose in like a lactose-free product. Or they'll add lactase to that. But that's a whole other thing. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know any of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard you kind of talk about it. And I'm like, oh, oh. this is um, this is fascinating. So obviously, the best, if you can get it, is isolate. What are your favorite products in terms of flavoring, um, even convenience that you can get that have that isolate as the first ingredient? Yeah. Isopure is one that I see. I've seen it at Target. Um, you okay. can get it. They make an unflavored one. Um, another one that's that's pretty good, the Dimatize brand. They have some people really like the, like the Lucky Charms or, no, the Fruity Pebbles flavor okay. of that one. So if you're looking for something a little more fun, um, one that's not an isolate program or a product but is very popular, sells out the shelves, is the Fairlife Nutrition Plan. So that is more of like that filtered milk product. Um, but you'll see those, again, readily available commercially or in like the big box stores like your Sam's or Costco or things like that. So, Wow. So um, so in the early period, what would you recommend then that people, when they're on full liquids, let's say, or even pureed, when you can do a little bit more, but you're not quite yet chewing, um, if you're, you know, should you just do protein shakes? Do you have other recommendations? If you're, again, like we were talking about, like, I got to chew. I got to do something. I have to do something. I cannot continue to just do these shakes. Yeah. Well, I think the unflavored protein can really come into play at that point um, because you can mix it into other types of foods. So soup, for example, is always a common one that we recommend um, because a lot of the shakes are super, super sweet. And people just you get tired of that, that sweetness. People after surgery also often say that 
um, their food is or things taste too sweet now. So mm, like I've used I've used this protein shake for years. I've been taking it and now it's too sweet for me. So we definitely hear that a lot. Um, so using the unflavored protein powders in your food mixed into foods can be helpful. Um, I'm always a big fan of a lot of our dairy products. So like Greek yogurt is like pro- if you're my patient, you've heard me recommend Greek yogurt. Like there's a zero percent chance unless you follow a special diet that has something else in consideration. But um, Greek yogurt, because you can thin it, you can mix it with stuff, you can flavor it. There's all sorts of different ones on the market that are sugar-free or no sugar added at this point. Um, So that's always one of my go-tos for protein. So how do you flavor it? Well, first you can just buy the ones that are flavored. Oh, okay. Easy. Duh. Duh. Yeah. Because they, it used to be that they were all super high in sugar. If they had flavor in them, they were full of added sugar. The companies soon learned that's not what people always want. They now have these sugar-free or no sugar added versions of these available. I personally, if I'm going to buy like plain yogurt, which tastes like sour cream. So if you ever need a sour cream substitution, Hmm. plain Greek yogurt is the answer. Um, But you can also, like, I take personally, I get frozen fruit. I like frozen berries. I pop them in the microwave. Let them, like, they'll distribute out, they'll let out all their juice. And then you can mix that into your yogurt. And it will give you that, like, juicy flavor. And then Mm. you also have, like, your berries with it. So it's like a little... And it makes it really cute and pink. Yeah. Yes. That is so, so (laughs) fun. So, okay. So you can get creative even in those beginning stages Mm -hmm. when there's not too, too many options. But as the diet progresses, as you go to now more soft foods and now even solid regular foods the rest of your life here, do you recommend that people still get their protein from the supplements, the shakes, the powders, the bars, or do you want them to get it from actual food? Ideally, we'd focus mostly on getting our protein from food. Okay. Um, When we think about it, there's something called like the food matrix, and that's where kind of all of our nutrients play and interact with each other in solid foods. There's also physiology of of chewing and that the, the sensation that that causes to your body. Like you said, even people get tired of not chewing. But chewing also sends signals to our brain to expect food food Mm. and to expect satiety. So when we're not chewing our food, sometimes if you've ever, especially somebody who hasn't had surgery, if you've ever had, say, like a protein shake or something and you're like, I was full and now I'm not. Like it just goes through so quickly. Um, There's not the signals for satiety there. So chewing can make a big difference. Of course, then also we're thinking about other vitamins and minerals that are found in our, in our food products versus maybe being added into a supplement or something. Um, That being said, I don't have anything inherently wrong with supplements, and I think that's exactly what they should be. It's a supplement to your diet. It should be used on an as-needed basis. There's plenty of people out there who have them every single day for breakfast, or they have them with their coffee in the morning, and that's all that they really tolerate for breakfast. They're like, I just have never been able to eat first thing in the morning. And if that's the thing that helps you get through, then I'm by all means go for it. Um, but when we look at where do we get protein, you know, we kind of have our two camps. We have our plant-based proteins and our animal-based proteins. Um, and when we talk about quality and absorbability, the animal-based proteins are going to be where we have that higher quality and absorption of protein versus the plant. That being said, you can absolutely follow a plant-based diet and be a bariatric patient. I have people that are doing it. They're doing great. So yes, I want to get into all those plant-based alternatives if you're a vegetarian or you're a vegan and all those. But let's back up more to a traditional animal-based. All the time, people will say, I'm tired of chicken. All I eat is chicken breast. And um, what what are even some more creative animal-based ones that we can do once you get into the regular diet phase? Well, first of all, chicken thighs. Just like go from the breast to the thigh. Okay. Your quality is just, the taste is just better. I'm also a dark meat person. That's oh. preference. But it's going to have a little bit higher fat content. And it's going to give you a different mouth feel. Okay. And especially earlier on when chicken can be really dry, oh, yeah. even if it's cooked mm. right and it's done mm-hmm. properly, it still can be really dry because you want to make sure it's well cooked. We don't want undercooked chicken. Um but the, the thigh tends to hold on to more moisture because it has a higher fat content. So I always, whenever I can, I will use the chicken thighs over the breast. So that's one little trick. But um, other things to consider would be our other meats. So there's, I think beef gets a really bad rap. And a lot of people think, they're like, I can't ever eat beef again. And where did, where did you hear that? Yeah. Like, who says? 
And is it the most health promoting thing that we should be having every single day of our lives? Probably not. Whoops. Um, do, you, do you eat beef every single I do, day? Pretty much. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Sorry. So, but you know, when we think about heart health and in those kinds of things, it's higher in saturated fat. Like there's reasons, but there's leaner cuts. And that's going to be the other thing. It's what type of beef are you choosing? Are you choosing an 80 20 ground beef? That means it's 80% lean and 20% fat. Or are you going for a 93 7 that's 93% lean, 7% fat? We're going to try to choose that leaner option. Um, Same with, you know, any of our cuts of of beef. But you've got turkey. You've got pork products. um, Those are all going to be animal, you know, sources of protein. Fish and seafood is an incredible way to get in your protein. Are you a seafood? Oh, I love. Love, love, All of it. All all of it. All of it. Same. I love all the seafood. Um, So, yeah. So, seafood is a great option. I mean, shrimp is basically like pure protein. Like, if you need protein, grab some shrimp. Perfect. Yeah. And eggs. Eggs. So eggs are are interesting. They're very high quality protein. We're really good at at using eggs. Um, And when we look at an egg, you know, obviously you have the white and the yolk. The yolk is very important. I think a lot of people eliminate the yolk because they've heard years and years of it's bad. It's good. It's bad. It's good. It's got choline. It's got vitamin D in it. It has the healthy fats in it that help us to absorb our other my, our, our, some of our vitamins and minerals. Um, but the white is where most of the protein is. So if you're thinking about eggs, sometimes it can be hard because one egg has like six grams of protein in it. So one is not a huge source. Mm-hmm. And for somebody with bariatric surgery, sometimes they can't even eat a whole egg. Right. And they're like, I can't even do one. But if you're getting to the point where you can have more than one, sometimes doing like one whole egg supplemented with egg whites, that's going to boost up the protein, keep the volume a little on the low side, but still give you the benefits of like that yolk. I love that. And when you talked about the six gram, there's that six, seven gram rule where I call it like the rule of sevens. Like mm-hmm. one egg is like seven grams of protein. One ounce is like seven grams of protein. So like you don't, some of us don't carry scales around with us everywhere we go and we want to measure precisely. So to try to figure out like, all right, how many grams roughly am I eating per meal? How many grams roughly am I eating per day? And what do you, how many grams do you try to tell our patients to lean into even especially in the beginning when it's just so hard to, 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 to get anything in. Yeah. So, yes, when we think about it, we, we aim, generally speaking, it dep- I, I base everything off people's heights. I think I throw people off when I'm talking to them and they're like, how much protein do I need? And I'm like, how tall are you? And so say you're 5'7", how tall I am. I would go and do some math and it all happens in my brain and now I just kind of guesstimate. It's always an estimate. It's sure. always an estimate. Exactly. Um, but I would say, okay, you probably need about 80 grams of protein a day. My little five two, five one ladies, not quite so much. Okay. I had a guy who was six four, and oh, I was yeah. like, "I'm sorry, sir, you are going to need to eat at least a hundred grams of protein a wow. day. You are just a very tall person. You're you have more mass, so we have to feed it." Um, he was like. Huh? What? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Now, a hundred grams, but when is enough? Enough. When is it too much? Yeah. I would say generally there's not that many people that need to be up in that 100 gram range. Okay. That, again, was like a very specific kind of thing. If you have a higher musculature, of course, you may need a little bit more. But, you know, I see. So the the calculation, again, I'm always going to go nerdy with you. Oh, I know. The calculation is, you know, generally for a general healthful person is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Okay. So, we, of course, we have to use estimates when we're thinking about people who are still at higher weights. We're not going to use their current weight because we would get very high quantities. And I also bump it up usually to about one gram as okay. opposed to the 0.8. So it's a little bit higher. Um, so if you look at, at what somebody's lean body mass is, which I estimate as their weight at BMI of 25, we use that as kind of our starting number. Got it. So if you're 5'7", you would want to be about 170, no, 160 pounds to be a BMI of 25. Okay. And then you would convert that into kilograms, and that would put you right around that 80 mark. Awesome. Yeah. Well, how does if you, you know, you eat too much protein, what could happen to you? And is it easy? Do you feel like our patients can even go there? Because people are so legitimately worried about that. Yeah. I think definitely, yes, people can go there. And I think that's when the supplements can get in the way Ah. because you're taking in three meals and then you're also doing an additional protein supplement. Um, And of course, again, protein does provide calories. So we do have to be cautious of that. You know, you get an extra 30 calories or 30 grams of protein in, that alone is an extra 120 calories, which not huge, but 
can impact your day, um, and especially if it's r- repeated. Um, if you get into very high levels of of protein, there's thought that you can actually cause kidney damage. Mm. Um, the kidneys are where our protein is is processed. So people who have kidney disease, later stages of kidney disease, are actually put on low protein diets to help protect their kidney function. Um, so that's a whole other thing. But you know, we kind of have to ride that fine line of of protein. Plus, at a certain point, we need the other. We need the fat and we need the carbs. And that's a whole thing. People are terrified of carbs. And they think lower and lower and lower is always better. But it's not truly the case. So eventually you're going to hit your – you're going to be like, great, I'm consistently meeting my protein needs. Now we can start to work in how do we do the carbs? How do we balance the diet out? Um, And so, yeah, I would say it's generally people aren't going to go to a point where they're hurting themselves. But – you know, you might also like get constipated. Like if you're just eating so much protein and nothing else, like you might have a hard time going to the bathroom. Mm. Um, there's other things that can happen in that sense, kind of yes. the side effect. Oh, we hear about constant. That's gonna, that's going to be a whole episode for like sure on constant. Yeah, yeah, more than that. I mean, we that is a major issue, and we know that our patients are being compliant with the diet, but they're also kind of miserable because yeah. that is the real deal with constipation. Now, we talked a little bit about you know the animal based proteins and all of the different you know okay we got meats, but there are always the patients out there who have religious beliefs and they avoid certain foods or even straight up vegetarians or even vegans. Mm-hmm. And you gave a phenomenal phenomenal talk at the bariatric retreat called It's a Plant Party, and that was super good. And I mean, I was blown away that there's Beyond Tofu out there, my friends. Yeah. Announcements, announcements. There are so many items out there that are plant-based proteins. And this is something to consider. If you are one of those people who's eating a lot of protein and you're like, eh, and I'm really backed up or I'm not feeling great, maybe switching out to some plant-based mm. proteins because what they do is offer fiber. And that's what kind of makes them a little bit different from our animal-based proteins. So some of the some of the ones that we mentioned, like you said, tofu, very common. It's what people generally think of. Then we have its little sister that nobody knows about or nobody seems to have heard about, tempeh, okay. which is a fermented soy product. And it kind of crumbles almost like a ground beef. Like you can put it into like a sauce and, and it crumbles like that. Um, you can make little strips with it. It's a little harder to – both tempeh and tofu are like kind of hard to cook. So huh. like try Have them. you made these? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've made you. some really bad tofu. Show off. Yeah. Oh, okay. But so I've made some really good tofu. Okay. Tempeh, I'm a little 50-50 on. It's harder for sure. Um, but it's got a higher amount of protein in it, which people don't realize. They think, to- they think tofu is like the end-all be-all. And then, of course, there's the less processed version of both of those, which is the soybeans, which is edamame. Mm. And that's a great snack. Like, talk about just, like, an easy, oh, balanced best. snack and so easy. Or if you're at a sushi restaurant, like, what a great Always. thing to have with your meal. Um, and then there's soy milk, which would just be the kind of the, to round out our soy products. Of course, too, there's the frozen products that are made from soy. There's all sorts of things. But then we have other things. So the, the plant-based protein that is most nutritionally comparable to chicken is called seitan, okay. S-E-I-T-A-N. Okay. It's made from vital wheat gluten. Sure. And so you take the I, this I have never made, and I okay. want to, but okay. I just have not. I Party at Hannah's, yes. everybody! Woo, we're gonna get <laughs> some vital wheat gluten. <laughs> um, so you make this thing, and it kind of makes like a loaf, and then you cut it up. But it's it's got like the texture and kind of that you can flavor it however you want. Um, and that's what like if you ever see like chicken strips or something like that, a lot of times they're made from that. You can also buy it pre-made. Um, so that's that's one that's non-soy. And then, of course, we have our beans, our lentils, mm. nuts and seeds. Um, green peas have a lot of protein. Again, we kind of talked about they make protein shakes out of green peas. Um, there's there's pea milk, which is a terrible name, oh. right? But it's actually not bad. Oh. Um, and then even things like spirulina, which is like a powder. Um, and then our grains have some quantity of protein. I think what we have to look at when people are on these vegetarian or vegan diets or plant forward diets, whatever whatever it might be, is the balance of the protein and the carbohydrates. Yes. And that's kind of where we have to toe the line and we have to say, okay, great, we can incorporate some of, you know, some beans sometimes, but maybe it's not at the level you used to do. And then when we look at it on a per unit basis, they are lower in protein generally than our, our animal-based products. Mm. Um Excuse me. So like a cup of beans 
would have about 15 grams of protein versus oh. three to four ounces of meat would have 20 to 30. Got it. So that's a big volume. If you think about a cup of beans, it's a lot. So I do always tell my patients who are um, on a plant-based diet, especially if they're truly vegan, that most likely supplementation is going to be come into play. Yeah. Because it's just we have to kind of meet that threshold and to do it from diet alone with the physical restriction of the size of the stomach as well, not even taking into account carb content or anything like that, but just that physical, you just may not be able to eat that much. Right. And so we have to look. But there are some really good vegan protein products out there. Um, I like the brand Owen, uh, O-W-Y-N. There's the Vega Protein or Gain. There's a bunch of different ones that are Again, they're in the stores. They're easy to find. Wow. Um, We're going to need to make a handout for all of our all listeners of to, with all of yes. this organized. You've get, you've just dropped so many little helpful like brands and tips. Yeah. And uh, I'm just blown away by all of this. I mean, again, my my knowledge on this, when people ask me, I'm like, um, I know about tofu, like I yeah. said already. <laughs> like, And that is not helpful like to anybody. But there are a lot, a lot, lot, lot of alternatives. Well, and then I didn't even go into, like you said, said like the beyond the impossible oh you know, yeah some of those commercial products and i kind of think of those in the same way that you would eat a regular burger it shouldn't be it's not the everyday thing it's not where the majority of your protein should come from but great if you're at a barbecue or you're you know having a night where you want something like a little bit exciting or fun or different like absolutely i think those can be great products or used in a ground you know use the ground versions of them if you're making like a sauce or something like that i think they can definitely be play a role or if you're out you know i think burger king even has like the oh, impossible yeah. so you know it's just giving more availability and i think that's the other thing is that plant based has become so much more prevalent oh yes so there's just more resources for people now to follow these diets it's on every menu i saw it at red robin the other day there it is oh. get that bad boy in a lettuce wrap and go to town yeah um well fantastic now you know we talk a lot about um you know the importance of protein you already talked about the lean muscle you um you know the metabolism helping you stay on track with your weight loss goals changing things up you know all of those things what about hair loss when the hair dun, ain't dun, there dun. yes what is that about well and and you know like how this is like we tell people it's like protein is going to be key in helping to prevent the hair loss protein getting your vitamins and minerals getting your fluid in all of those things are important even with doing that unfortunately we do see hair loss I think there are just people that are predisposed to it. Mm. And when you're in these very low calorie diets, which people are after surgery, you know, hair isn't a priority. As much as it is for us, our body does not see it that way. Yes. Our hair is very much, you know, a, a, a just kind of an extra thing. And so it's not going to put the energy into really maintaining it. So I always tell people, you know what, talk to the person at your salon as well as us because they're going to know more about the external bits of your hair than we do. You can cut your hair short. You can stop coloring it. Stop doing restrictive. She's like, never. Um, <laughs> stop pulling it in like very tight styling, things like that. So you're preventing breakage and pulling. Um, those are kind of the physical things. And then eat your protein. Yes. Um, and then get creative with it. It'll grow back. Yes. It's I was not... going to say, it is temporary, my friends. Do not panic. What time frame do you typically see um, hair loss if it were to occur? Three to six months. Yeah. It's usually right after that big first drop Ooh, of yeah. weight, you know. It's like your body is just like losing, losing, losing. And then it just, again, it's kind of – it's gone into this mode where it's not really sure what to do. So it's like, okay, this is like low priority. It falls off the list. Right, right, right. So, and unfortunately, it's more common in women than – and men. Yes. And it is more also um, more common in white women. Mm -hmm. I've seen um, women of ethnicity and color. I don't see it as often. Is that your experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, that could be play. Some of that could play and they wear a lot more protective hairstyles as well. And that's true. Um, you know, I think, again, there's that external care of hair that that impacts that too and i think for for people with obesity and especially especially women a lot of times their hair is the their point of pride yeah and it's the thing that they've been able to have control of with their appearance and with how they are and a lot of people hide behind hair or use it as a distraction or something like that and so you know and it, i think sometimes it, you may feel minimized in being concerned about like oh it's hair loss you know 
people might shut it down, but like that's a big part of a lot. I mean, oh, absolutely. People that did it, our whole first episode, we talked about our hair. Like, I know. Like, <laughs> like, Seriously. It's a big part of identity. So, definitely. And I think that it is, you know, we get that all the time. Like, I'm so worried about having the surgery because I'm worried about hair loss and I'm worried about um, loose, saggy skin. And, you know, these sorts of things, again, seem superficial, but in reality, they are. This is – you can't lie. You can't just say I'm only doing this for my diabetes. No, you care about the way you look too. And then I think that is a very important consideration. And we um, can get you through it. Again, it's a temporary time frame and, you know, tips and tricks. And, and as far as the hair goes, what do you think about biotin? The research is, like, just so mixed on biotin and collagen. And lately now I've been seeing more about, like, don't take biotin. I think it's kind of a short term. Like, you can take it and supplement it. Um, you know, there's definitely things that show that it does promote hair growth. I think it's one of those things that it probably won't hurt. It might not help. But if you want to take it, if you have excess, you'll pee it out. That's all I know. I know. Might be expensive urine. I'll yeah, say that. Like your nails might like uh, yeah, your... shoot out and you have to get more expensive, you know, manicures. your manicures yeah. and all of that. My best friend was taking biotin for a while and she was like, all that happened was my leg hair got thicker. Oh boy, that's she a was like, fun no, side I'm effect. Gonna, yeah, like why would my head hair didn't get thicker, but my leg hair did. So Ooh, she boy. was like, stop that. Yeah, seriously. So, you know. And then, and guys, listen, we've, we, we've harped on this, but it is temporary. You'll get a lot of new growth. It mm-hmm. comes at like your part line. You'll have a lot of these little baby hairs Please, and yeah. – and um, it's kind of cute. Yeah. So It's uh, like pregnancy. It you is. Know. There's Same. so many parallels. I've right? always said that. It, all of this is. It's like. It's, it's a temporary situation that you're in. It is. It is it's a new land. You can read all the books you want to read about it until it happens to you. It's it's still just, you know, you can make yourself sick with worry. And then you see, you're like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought. Yeah. And, you know, all, of, all the details there. Yeah. So protein, tons of stuff. We, we understand that it is the um, just the cornerstone of the macros and of a diet and for all of these things, metabolism, helping to keep your skin as tight as possible, Mm -hmm. helping with muscle mass, lean muscle mass, helping with um, preventing hair loss and that sort of thing. What would you say... um, if somebody is following the rules so, so, so strongly, they are following this high protein diet, they're minimizing their carbs and sugars, they are working on their hydration, all of the key things that we harp on over and over again, but they have been stuck. They're on a plateau, mm-hmm. even they're going up and down the same one or two pounds, and it's been weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. What do you think? There's there's two things. So one is like if you are truly – like if you have tracked and you know this is accurate – if you're just guessing that you're accurate, take a step back, track okay. for a few days, because you may just surprise yourself. It may not be as accurate as you thought. If not, it's actually going to be try increasing your carbs a little bit. Yeah. Up them, up em, you know, have something that's a complex carb. Go for some fruit. Have some okay. dairy product. You know, maybe even depending on how well you do with meeting your goals, if you have some room in your stomach, maybe going for like some potato or sweet potato, something that's that more complex. Beans, again, I'm always, I'm a big fan of beans. Same. Um, Add those in because they're going to give you the fiber, but they're going to give you some of that additional carbohydrate. And you'd be shocked. People are like, yeah, I've had such low intake and they go up a little and they're like, just like that. Yep. Like weight lost. Yep. So you have to change it up. You so have to change it up. Yeah. Sometimes as creature of habits, and there are patients I see every year. I've seen them year after year after year, and I I write down what they say. So I say, "What do you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks? Give me every detail." And some of them are incredibly neurotic, and they write down everything, and they have it. They'll come out the next year. It is crazy. Sometimes they are saying word for word the same exact thing. And sometimes, like, when you figure out the right combo, like, just keep yeah. using it if it's a key to success. And sometimes um, I think that can be a detriment a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So protein, um, you know, change it up. Get creative. There's lots of different sauces, lots of different oh, alternatives. Yeah. Snacks, that's another big thing. You know, when you're reaching for a snack, what are your rapid fire kind of um, go-to high protein snack ideas? Um, cheese sticks. Okay. Um, you can always pair. And I'm, I, for me, a snack should always be kind of a pair of things. So okay. you want like you want your protein and then you probably want a little bit of complex carb with it. So okay. fruit and a cheese stick or fruit and some like a little peanut butter. I already said Greek yogurt. Always going to be my go-to. Okay. Um, beef jerky. Protein bars. Sometimes that's what's available. And yep. That's what you can do. Um, edamame. Yes. Great snack. Keep some in your freezer. Pop it out. Um yeah, those are some. Those I, are also, awesome I also ideas. got the dried edamame, which I think would be, I haven't done it yet, but I think it'd be really good in a salad. They're like oh, super yeah. crunchy. 
Oh my gosh. Tasty. No, I'm ob- I'm obsessed. And I I would actually go as far as you you suggested it. I would actually require it. If you like it, get it. I mean, they have all these different to- toppings at these sushi restaurants yeah. like you said. Get it with salt, get it with like truffle oil, get it with um parmesan. Yeah. Like get it and I think that'll like it, it helps you to like you're just you're still eating, so you're still, you know, you're going for it. You're getting filled up, you're getting some protein, and it'll help you to, you know, be satisfied yeah. um with with lots and that's, of food. That's the thing I think I missed was protein is satiating. So protein helps you keep mm. full. It helps slow down the absorption of your food. So thinking about if you're a bypass patient, you know, how do we prevent dumping is we have protein with our carbs. We make sure that we're not – we're eating it first. We always we, – you'll hear me – that's another thing I say so many times in a day. Protein first should be the first thing that goes in because it's going to kind of fill up that stomach and then we're going to top it off with our like fiber and our little carbs and all of that. And you said dumping. How, how would you define dumping? When does Ooh. that happen? So there's there's two kinds of dumping, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. There are two kinds of dumping. So that's like for sure. Early, kind of early and, uh, and late. So the early is, and correct me if I've been explaining this wrong. I think I got it right. Okay. But the I don't early mean to put is, you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm like, I explained it, but I'm like, just hope I've been doing it right. Um, early is when the food goes too quickly into the intestine and we get a big fluid shift. And the fluids all rush to the intestine and then we have diarrhea. And then late is when that happens, but instead of the fluid shift, you get the big release of insulin, mm, Yes. overproduction of insulin, and we end up with a low blood sugar. And so you get that shaky, sweaty nausea kind of. Exactly. And, and there's the third dumping, oh. which is not dumping. It, it means like when you think dumping, you think meaning having diarrhea or having to go to the bathroom. And that's not really it. So it is exactly what Hannah described. So it typically happens if you're doing this huge carb load, if you're binging on something high in sugar, and then your body is now after surgery so good at getting rid of all of that blood sugar that you've you've taken in, that you'll get a hyper response and you'll have a high amount of insulin on the scene, which actually results in hypoglycemia or low blood sugar if you have consumed too much sugar. So that is the key thing to balance this all out. The protein will help to anchor you. It'll help to prevent those fluxes where you feel like just terrible, lousy, and a little bit queasy. So protein is king and queen of all. It is so, so, so important. Yes, absolutely. What's your favorite protein dish? Um, ooh, um, I'm going to sound like such a diva, but like my favorite food on earth is Wagyu. Like if I were to get like A5 Wagyu, like yeah. on the most special of occasions, it's extre- extremely expensive. I've had, a, you know, a few bites of it in my life. And if you're ever at, at a special moment, oh my gosh, it's just the most amazing. That's, I mean, that's not my everyday. I wish. Yeah, right. I mean, we're going to have to do a lot more podcast episodes. You guys got to listen. We got to get some uh, some (laughs) brand recognition here so I can be eating my A5 Wagyu. But what is your favorite? Uh, Yeah, that's a great question. I I love shrimp. I really do. Me too. My fiance is allergic, so it's really annoying. Oh, no. So I I eat it when I'm out. Like, it's one of the things because he can be around it. I just am, like, not going to cook two meals for us. So I don't make it a lot. But I do love shrimp. I love all seafood, to be honest. So do I. yeah, I would say I would say it lean more seafood. And that and I think that you've already recommended that as like a go to protein. It's so great. And when I was in Maryland and even in Florida, I mean we're not a landlocked state down here. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, Maryland crabs and even all kinds of shellfish, seafood. Oh, that is I think yeah. it's simply the best. So if you like it, Go, go for, for it. it. It's always a winner. Absolutely. Always, always. Well, boy, if people don't know what to eat, I don't know what else to tell them, huh, Hannah? I mean, <laughs> we you, we, we, we've given you a lot of um, protein suggestions, and we are going to come your way with some really great downloadable guides and some um, nice images that really just showcase exactly what are some animal-based, plant-based, liquid forms, pureed forms, soft, regular food for every part of the diet, every diet um, consideration out there. We want to make sure that you are getting your protein in. Absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, if you are here, follow us on Instagram at Dr. X Dietitian, and we look forward to talking to you the next time and have a wonderful day, night, wherever you are. Absolutely. Thanks for listening, and we'll hear from you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.